The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. Amen. This morning I want to speak and teach on the subject of being grounded, being rooted in God's love. Because love and what we've already talked about, we've sung about, the love of God is the most important thing that you can discover. There are many attributes about God. There's many things about him that are amazing. But it all stems out of his love, his eternal love for us. And yes, as Michael said in that wonderful word of interpretation, thank you for that, that God poured out all he had. And you know, all of that that he had came out of his love for you. And I want to gently speak to you today and encourage you and share with you this love. You need this love. You need his love. And we need together to receive that love. God's love can only affect us if we allow him to give us that love. And a lot of people have a mental understanding of God's love. But the born-again man or woman has an experience with that love. That love comes into us and it actually changes the inside of us, the inner man. It transforms us. And it gives us this incredible sense of um, significance, purpose, stability, strength. This love is so powerful. When you know that God loves you, you will be such a stable person in your life. You will be such a person that can carry Jesus. You can't carry Jesus in your life without being grounded in his love. And St. Paul knew about that love. And the Bible says that God actually is love. Take all the things that you see that are wonderful, that he created, put them all together, but all of them can't contain what he is fully. But love does. Love contains what God is fully, the essence of who he is, the person of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Love. They are love. And that is what love is, God. The fullness of God is the fullness of his love. I wonder if that love is where you operate from. I wonder if that love is what you truly are as a born-again believer because that love makes us like Jesus. Jesus came and he showed us what love looked like. Everything he did was an act of love. Him coming was an act of pure love. He didn't have to. He chose to. So love is always a choice and God freely chose to display his love for us on the cross. On that cross, God poured out all his love for you. All his love was given to you on that cross. When he died, he died as you to give you, to be able to transfer all of his love to you. This love is so powerful. When you doubt that you love, when you doubt that you're loved, when you doubt that you're good enough, we just need to be reminded again to be grounded, to put our roots deep, our spiritual roots, our spirit man roots into this love. Nothing can make up for or substitute God's love in your life. No amount of success or money or dream or some satisfying thing, some physical experience, even some emotional experience can actually be equal to God's love in your life. You need God. You need his love to help you in your problems. The only thing that will keep you in the storms of life are his love and the knowledge of his love for you. That's what keeps a man and not keeps a woman in God, knowing that you are loved. You can face any problem when you know that you are secured and stable in his love. The apostle said straight out that God actually is love. In 1 John 4 verse 8, he said, he who doesn't love does not know God, for God is love. That's what God is. God is love. God's not a judge. He's not a jury. He's not a watchdog. God is love. He has love for you. Love, love, love. He loves you. In verse 16 of 1 John 4, it says, God is love. He who abides, who lives in this love, abides in God, and God will abide in him. So as Christians, 
What's the most important thing you need in your life to abide in this love and to recognise that you can abide and live in the love of Christ when you understand what he did for you? This might be very basic, but we all have to go to the basics because when things happen and we don't like what's going on or when things come our way and we don't know how to deal with them, love will anchor your life. Love will keep you together. God's love for you will carry you through those waves. God's love has done it for me. God's love has been able to shelter my life. God's love has kept me in in times of great difficulty, in times of loneliness, in times of battle, in warfare. It's only God's love that can keep you and I. So St. Paul tells us in chapter 3 of Ephesians, we'll have a look at a few verses, verse 14 to 19, Ephesians chapter 3. And the, the Ephesian letter was written while Paul was in jail and he was writing to the Ephesians. They were very discouraged that Paul was imprisoned. And he says to them not to worry. I'll read from verse... 13, it says, therefore, I ask you, don't lose heart because of my trouble, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen? That's awesome, isn't it? Very powerful. So verse 16 says, that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, the richness of God's glory, the richness of who God is in his glory, may God grant to you out of those riches that you would be strengthened with the might of God through his spirit in the inner man. Now, it's the inner man, the spirit-filled man, the man that was baptised, the person that was baptised, the sin life was cut off from them and the spirit life was 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 actually raised up. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead has raised you up now in this life, in this love. And it's the spirit man that receives the love of God, not the mental person. It's not the physical. The flesh can feel moments and can experience love, even human love, great experiences. But it's, that is not God's love. That is human love, and that will come to an end. All human love will end. The only love that goes on forever and eternal love is the love of God the Father. And you see, Jesus knew this love. That's why he did what he did and he lived the life that he lived. Because it tells us in chapter 17 of John's Gospel, when Jesus is praying this incredible intimate prayer, we get to see how Jesus spoke to the Father. And he says in chapter 17, verse 24, I think, he says, you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus knew that God loved him and that's why he could do what he did. It carried him. It took him. And the spirit life of Christ, that spirit man now lives in you. And you can be strengthened in the might of your spirit in the inner man only through God's spirit in you. That love comes there and it's the inner man. And I'd like to suggest to you in verse 16 that to be strengthened with God's might is simply to surrender and walk and make a decision to walk by the Spirit of God. Every day, every day, every situation, you've got an opportunity to deal with this in the flesh or to deal with this in the spirit man. And it's a choice we have to make every day. We don't need to deliver our flesh. We need to crucify our flesh in order to live by the Spirit. We need to submit to God. We are to crucify, and remember, we were crucified on the cross with Christ. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. Do you understand? 
He didn't just die for you to take away your sin. He died as you to make you like him, to put this love in you, to transfer all of him into you, your spirit life man. And your spirit man is alive now in Christ. And your spirit man is the one that deserves to live for God. It's the spirit life within you that has the power to understand what I'm saying today and to receive it by faith. It's all by faith. The only time we are struggling and battling is when we're not surrendered to this love and we're not walking according to this spirit life. We're walking and sowing in the flesh. And there's, and there's terrible results of that. But when we walk and we choose and we make mistakes, but when we choose to walk in the spirit, we are reaping life now and peace. And we reap this love. We reap the fruit of God in our life. And so this strength, this might comes when you surrender to Holy Spirit and you decide by your free will to live like him, to behave like him, to choose to be like Jesus. And what did Jesus show us? He said, I'm going to show you how to love. I know the world says treat your enemies like this, but I give you the power to do the opposite. You treat them with love. You forgive them. If someone asks you for something, don't expect it back and don't ask for it back. Let them have it and give them more. He spoke the opposite. He showed us a level of life, of love, that this world does not know. It's the opposite. While the world is doing this to protect themselves and get all they can and get mine, Jesus says, no, give it all away. Seek first the kingdom. Love God more than you do anything else. That's what Jesus showed us, and that's what Jesus taught. So to be strengthened with this might and the strength of this inner man is simply to surrender to the Holy Spirit. That's the start of this. Then in verse 17 it says that through his Spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Is Jesus dwelling in your hearts? Is Christ truly the king of your heart? Or does he just visit you have visitations with him or does he dwell? When someone lives with someone, you get to know them. When someone visits you, they're going out the door, they're going back to their life. But when someone lives with you, you see them, you watch them, you hear them. When two people live together in, in a house, it's pretty hard to hide what's going on. It's pretty hard to live separately. Jesus came so that he could dwell in our hearts, live in our life, make a residence, a permanent dwelling place. And actually, in the Greek, the word used here, I won't get into the details, but it actually means permanent dwelling place. Christ, may Christ be your permanent dwelling place in your heart. He permanently dwells there. That means he never leaves there. He has set up home. That's why Jesus said in chapter 14, of John's Gospel, he said, If you love me and you keep my words, my Father will love you and we, we, Father and Son, will come and we will dwell in you. We will live in you. How do we access that? By keeping his words. Keeping the words of Christ in our life. Keeping those words offers to us the love of the Father. Jesus said, If you love me, you keep my words. You keep my words. Love is not a, a, a saying. Love is a commitment. It's an action. And keeping Christ's words is showing that we're obedient to him and we love him. So he then will dwell in us. So Christ has to dwell, have permanent dwelling in your heart, and it's by faith. And recognizing why does he deserve that place? Because of what he did at Calvary. No one is ever going to love you like this. No one can love you the way he has loved you. That's why that love is so beautiful and holy and restoring. That's why a man and a woman can leave. We can leave our sin and we can become like him. We can leave it at the foot of the cross and his blood can wash away everything. Only Christ can do that. That's pure love. He looks at us with this pure love. And when he lives in us, it's just flowing. It's in us. Now, Paul says also here that we would be strengthened in the, in the um, verse 17, sorry, he may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. 
And I looked into this a little deeper and did some research. But what does it mean to be rooted? What does it mean to have the tree roots grounded? Now, some of you might know a bit about gardening, but it's everything that happens with the growth of a tree comes out of the roots. It's in the root system. The architecture and the potential of that tree is all in the roots. When the seed goes down and it actually, as a dead seed is put into the ground, it actually comes alive and it begins to grow a root system. That root system is actually the life, the true core life of the tree. It's not the tree follicles, the branches, or the physical external side that actually is the true core of the tree. The true core of a tree is the structure underneath the earth that no one sees. It's underneath the soil and it's the actual stability and strength and all of the nutrients and all of the water that a tree receives, it goes down first into the roots. I mean, if you water the tree leaves, you're not watering the tree. You water the tree when you water the roots and out of the roots comes out all of the life. And this is what Paul is saying, that as a believer, it is vital that you are rooted and grounded in God's love, that the roots of your life, the core of your soul and spirit is grounded and stable in the love of Christ for you. When you are grounded in that knowledge, that's when you will become a fruitful tree. That's when you will grow and be able to abide in Christ and grow the life that he has, that he wants to grow out of you. The height of a tree is in the roots. Peter and I, where we live, we've been living there a while now, and we had these massive two front trees on our nature strip. And one day a heavy wind came and blew a massive branch on my daughter's car, and praise God, nothing was broken, but it was really dangerous. So the council came and they removed the trees. It took them one week to uproot those roots. And even now, today, it's been six, seven years since those roots came out. The ground, is there's a cavity in there, so great were the roots. And they told us that the roots of that tree went right underneath the foundations of our house because roots will find a way to grow. They will push past even formations of foundations, of rock and stone. They will go hard, down, deep, 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 deep. Because that's what they do. They grow and they will find a way to grow and keep growing. So you're looking at a tree. You're looking at a tree, but the foundation underneath that could be massive. It could go on for, you know, half a kilometre. The roots could keep going underneath the ground for half a kilometre. And that's what our understanding is here of this, that Paul's saying be rooted and grounded. Your roots have to be in God's love. You have to be grounded in his love for you. There, underneath there, is an unshakable strength. And trees, according to Wikipedia, a tree is rooted in the ground of its soil and to, it's there to keep this tree from growing the wrong way. It's there to keep the tree to grow straight and stable and absorb the water and nutrients. And then out of that, it will produce what the tree needs for its growth, development and repair. So I felt like the Holy Spirit showed me something here. Your growth your development and even the repair, because life does things, the weather, the influences that are beyond our control come against our life. Jesus said that a tree is known by the fruit. He actually said that our life is like a tree and we grow stuff. And when we're rooted and grounded in Jesus, we're going to grow good, beautiful stuff. Now, You know, sometimes trees, if they are neglected, if they are even in a desert, they can still grow. It's very hard to kill the root system of a tree. It's pretty hard. You have to literally uproot it or it has to be completely and utterly starved, starved for it to die. But even in the desert, trees grow. And there are some times when life There might be a cyclone and a tree is uprooted. It's got to be pretty severe weather to uproot the roots of a tree, but it can happen. For us as a Christian, if you are grounded 
in the love of God, when those trials come, nothing will uproot you. Psalm 92 talks about us being like a tree planted. We are planted and some trees, they bounce back. They bounce back after they've actually been knocked down, like the palm tree. The palm tree goes back down and up with a cyclone. It can be knocked down and look like it's finished and then six months later that tree is producing fruit again. So trees are like our life. And in our life, our spirit life has to be anchored in Christ's love, the cross. Where do you find this love? If you're not moved in the music, in the worship, when we sing about Jesus, that's where I get moved. That's when I think about I just want to cry. I have to hold myself together to not cry, especially if I'm going to speak because I don't want to get up here and be you know, all crazy. I want to be focused on what the Lord has told me I need to share. Think about that, though. Is your life really grounded? Are you grounded? Are you soaked in those deep roots of the knowledge of God's love for you? Or is that just something that you think about every now and then, but it's really not, not something that actually keeps your life going? It comes back to the cross. It comes back to Jesus' love for us. And when we're anchored in that, the knowledge and the foundation of that anchors our life, our walk. Our walk is affected by the knowledge of that love. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul said, Therefore, my brethren, my dearly beloved brethren, longed for my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord, my dearly loved ones. And maybe someone needs to hear that today. Stand firm. You are a good tree. Stand firm in that love. That love, no one can separate you from God's love. Nothing can separate you from God's love. You can't separate yourself from God's love because God won't let you go. You can go to the other side of the world and God's love will be there for you. You can go to the deepest pit and God's love is waiting for you there. You can make the worst mistakes of your life and God's love is there waiting and his arms are outreached toward you. People might not do that for you, but God will always do that for you because he loves you. And you should not be down on yourself. You should be down in those roots. Don't be down on yourself. Be down-rooted, grounded in the love of Christ. That's where you need to be. With any struggle, with any hiccups, that's the only thing that will stabilise your life. You need sometimes to develop. You know, a tree in that development stage when the root system is actually being developed, there's no growth on the outside. No one sees anything much happening. But that tree is more alive. There's so much work going on as those seeds and those flat capillaries are growing and building and building and building and building. And that's what God does in us. He wants to build and build and build and keep bringing you back to the basic of most basic of things, that God loves you. Get that love, grow in that love, develop that love and be that love. We're here to be love. We are the only evidence on this earth of God's love. God's love is not seen in a bird flying in the sky. The glory of his creation is, but God's love is only seen in you and me. And the way we live our life, is the, it's the symphony of God's love. It's the song that's singing out to God and to the world, to the people in your life, that God is love. God's love. So we can't be love to someone else. We can't keep what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And then love your neighbour as yourself. We can't do that if we don't understand this love. Or sometimes we've moved away from the love. Our love has grown cold. Again, that can happen. Our love can grow cold when we don't listen, when we ignore, when we don't feed on the word of God, when we don't talk to God and we don't involve God. God's a person. He doesn't barge his way. He doesn't battle to have priority. He gives us everything and he says, now I'm here for you. I want, I want all of you, but do you want all of me? That's what God says. Let me have all of you. 
Let me show you all my love. The deeper, the more you want of him, the more love you will receive. And you will develop and grow, just like a tree develops and grows, in its ability to form the root system. God is developing us. Even if we've been a Christian a long time, it never stops. To the day you close your eyes and go to heaven, the biggest mission that God has for you is to understand, comprehend this great love he has for you. Because when we get to heaven, that is all that remains is his love. His love. His love goes on and on and on and has no end and it will never end. So our spirit life is like a tree. Tree roots take in nutrients and the growth of a tree needs to receive the nutrients, which is the word of God, which is taking communion, which is praying, which is fellowship. All those things bring nutrients and life and sustenance to the root system of your life when you're rooted in Christ, grounded in Christ. Do you remember the parable of the sower where Jesus talks in chapter 13 of Matthew? He explains to the disciple the parable sower, verses 18 to 23. I won't read it all. We don't have time. But here in this, he says there's four basic soil types. The first soil, when the seed, the word of God goes out and the seed goes out, our heart represents the soil. And the first soil is, um, let me see. uh, It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So the first soil is the person that doesn't understand. They have a mental relationship with God. They have a religious experience, but not a spirit experience, a surrender experience, where they're born again of God's love, where they understand and they can receive. They have a mental experience. Pastor Peter says that's, that's a person that hasn't truly repented. They haven't turned away from sin. They haven't actually let go of their life and become now a new person in Christ. So when the wicked one comes, he snatches it. They might even come to church. That's why a religious person can sit in church and go to church. I spoke to a woman this week who loves God. She thinks she loves God and she believes she loves God. Her two boys work in the church and they are altar boys and they do all this stuff. And she believes that that is the the best thing she could do. But when I said to her, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? She didn't know what I meant. She had no idea what that meant. So this is that kind of soil. It's a person that doesn't understand. So the wicked comes, even if they hear the word of God, the wicked one comes and he steals that seed, that word, and it's snatched away, and that person doesn't get it. The second seed, the person that receives it on stony places, stony places, so it's shallow stone, not deep soil, that they hear the word and they receive it with joy, but then they have no root in themselves, Jesus said, and they endure for a while, and when trouble or tribulation comes, because of the word, they immediately stumble because they have no root, you see. That's the Christian that has no root, so the seed can't actually penetrate and go down deep. The third person receives the seed among the thorns, They hear the word, but the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word and they become unfruitful. So what Jesus is saying here, again, they're hearing, but because of the thorns, the things that are not correct in their life, the things that are dangerous, the things related, thorns represent sin in the Bible. The thorns that were placed on Jesus' head represent sin placed on him. So thorns were a part of the curse and the fall of man. So the person that receives The word amongst sin, amongst the thorns, easily has that word removed from them because the cares and the worries of this life choke it out. And then the fourth person, and this is the person that we, as a born-again person, as you as a born-again spirit-filled man or woman, this is the, the seed has to be received in your life on good ground. You hear the word, you understand it, and then that will go on to bear fruit and it produces 60, 30, or 100-fold fruit. So, every good tree bears good fruit, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 17 to 20. What's the good fruit? Joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, 
gentleness, self-control. That is the actual fruit and the result of God's love manifesting in your life. When you are rooted and grounded, your life as a tree will produce that. You cannot produce that of your own. You can imitate fruit. You can try to manufacture it, but it's not God's fruit. And I'll tell you, God's fruit in people's lives is evident. And a man, a woman of God knows that fruit. You recognize it, even with someone you don't personally know. You can go somewhere, you can be at a conference, you can you meet someone and you can know immediately this man, this woman is a person of God. This person loves God. The fruit is in them. It's like the fruit jumps out at you. That fruit is the true person of who you are. That's the core. That's a person that's grounded. If the roots are corrupted, they're a bad tree. A bad tree is a sinful tree, a, 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 a person still in sin. This is not a believer. Believers are not still in sin. They might battle with things, but they are not in sin, in lawlessness. And Jesus said a bad tree produces bad fruit. What's that bad fruit? Anything that's corruption, anything that is of corruption to the soul. So trees, your life have a root system that need to you have the you have the job of making sure that you are rooted by posturing your heart by putting down in your life the most important thing to be grounded in the knowledge of God's love for you if your wife or your husband is not in that place it's a difficult challenge isn't it if your children are not in that place if you work with someone that does not know God your prayer for that person and the way to reach that person is to be like God to them and to love them. Now, love is not passive. Love is determined. Love is an action. Love is sometimes quite harsh. It will discipline. It says that in Hebrews, that God's love, sometimes it disciplines us. We get a whack. I've had it a few times in my life, and it's not nice. But sometimes we need it because we get so full of ourselves. We get our thinking wrong. We make it about us. We become so self-absorbed. Love is not self-absorbed. It tells us in 1 Corinthians that love is patient, love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love does not boast about itself. Love gives. Love shares. Love forgives. Love keeps no record of what is wrong. It doesn't keep an account. It doesn't love and get excited and think, good, I'm glad that you're in trouble. It doesn't rejoice in evil. Love is pure. Love is sacrificial. Love believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. That's what love is. And that's the love. When you are grounded in God's love, that's the man or woman that you are. You might have doubts about that, but that's the man or woman you are before God. That's a beautiful person. You're a, you're a powerful being because you're grounded in this love. It's reassuring to know that. I want you to be reassured, church. I want you to know without a doubt that that love for you, you might be still growing in that root system. You might still be experiencing you know, understanding and, and, and struggling to understand. Something's happening in your life and you think, how is this God's love to me? But it all is God's love. God's love is in everything that comes your way. God's love is in every word that he says to you. He speaks to you in love. Everything that he gives to you comes out of his love. When you are submitted to that love, then the fruit will come. You don't have to do it yourself. Our life in Christ will develop. In John 15 verse 9, it says, that, As the Father has loved me, this was one of the first things that I ever read in the Bible that changed my life, where he said to me, Sonia, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go out and to bear fruit. Whatever you ask, I will give it to you. That's what God, the first thing that I ever read in the Bible for myself. And then after that it says, as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. Friend, you need to abide and live, make your permanent fixture on that love, on the love that he gave you on the cross. You need to identify with Jesus. You need to see it again. While I was away in New Zealand, I was watching on Netflix AD. Some of you have seen it. I know my nephew um, encouraged me to watch it a while ago, and I got to see some of it. And seeing Jesus, I mean, it was, you know, 
seeing Jesus die like that and again be able to recognise that he did that for me, it, it, it affected me again. I've been a Christian a long time. But at the end of the day, I can die today knowing that he loves me. I tell you, that's the only thing that matters. Please know that he loves you. If you don't know that, you need to seek him and go to the cross. You need to hear the messages we preach here. Leave the baggage and hear. Hear God's heart for you, his love for you, please. He loves you so much. And nothing will take you away from that love except yourself. He embraces you in that love. He holds you in that love. He speaks to you tenderly and he will speak to you firmly like a father. But he loves you and every time he speaks, it's always coming from that place of great love. Sometimes you need to repair just like a tree needs to be repaired. Sometimes a tree needs to be cut back and pruned. It's painful. It's the worst season of life. It looks like you're barren. It looks like there's nothing there and there's nothing good. But listen, there is good and it's going to come. In due time, it will come. That cutting back, that cutting off, that repair is because there's damage there. There's an infestation in your tree, in your trunk, in your branches, in your leaves, and it needs to be cut off. It needs to be pruned back. It needs to be removed. And that's what Father does. He's a gardener. God the Father is a gardener. And he comes and he does this work and he does that to repair us. The battles and the warfare of life, they come against us as Christians. You try to be dynamic for God. You start sharing about Christ. You start praying for people, laying hands on people, delivering people of demons, and you have just entered warfare that you didn't know was possible because he hates the name of Jesus, the devil, and he hates you walking in the power of his love and affecting others with that love. He'll come against you. So he tries to wipe you out. He tries to do things to shut you down. But hallelujah, whatever storm comes, whatever bad, harsh weather comes, Jesus is stronger. His love is stronger. And it's in your root system. So it's not going anywhere. It's underneath there. That great love will keep you in that love. Verse 18 says we need to comprehend and receive and understand that love. Comprehend and understand what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height of this love. Now, I just want to read something from a gospel song by F. M. Lehman. I haven't actually heard the song, but in the song, he wrote, Could we with ink the ocean fill and the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. And that was actually taken from a man who was in an asylum who wrote some words. He wrote those words on the wall of his mental institution. Everyone thought he was crazy. And he penned those words. And he was trying to explain this great love of God. And he said, if you try to fill the ocean with ink, it's never going to happen. We can never do that. We could never do that. And he was saying that we may never be able to grasp or understand this human love, uh, this godly love, this this divine love that God has for us. Just like we can't take a hold of the oceans, we can't measure that, but it's all found in God. It's all found in Christ for us. And another thing that I read which was really interesting was a theologian was asked by a student, he was a great theologian, and he was asked by a student, what do you consider to be the most significant theological truth that you have ever discovered? Now listen to this, Bible college students, hear this. The man, theologian, who'd spoken to millions of people said, the greatest theological truth that I have ever discovered is this, Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How simple is that? How simple is that? Out of that simplicity that even a child, a baby, can receive that. That's the first thing we teach our Christian babies is that song. I hope you sing it. Young parents, I hope you sing that from the moment your baby comes into this earth, which is corrupted, that they would know that song and that you would sing it, lullaby it into their spirit because they receive that in their spirit that they may grow up and understand that. 
That's the greatest thing you can discover, that Jesus loves you and that you know it. You know it with your being. You know it with everything that you are. Then, of course, you don't become a jealous person. You don't become a selfish person. You don't behave unbecomingly because you live and reside with that dwelling love of God in your heart. That love woos you. It speaks to you. It's with you. It's greater than anything. It's more important. That love is the privilege of you knowing God the Father. It's more valuable to you than any other relationship. That's what the core of discipleship is. That's why when Peter was restored, when Jesus went and made breakfast, after he had gone, he died and he resurrected. Peter was very out of sorts with Jesus. He had denied and betrayed him. He felt shocking. And Jesus went to him, told him to put the nets on the other side. They caught a massive catch. Peter runs out to Jesus on the water. And Jesus has made him breakfast. And he, he says to him, Peter, do you love me? That's all he said and that's all he cares about. Do you love me? Because I love you. I love you. Do you love me? When you're grounded, when you're rooted in the love of God, you can answer Jesus back and say, I love you. Why? Because you love me so much. How can I not love you? Where can I go from this love? I can't go anywhere because this love has completely captured and taken over my life. Be reminded this week in the endless love of God, in the love that is so great that nothing, not even the dying death of someone you love, not even the worst possible experience of your life, the most terrible thing that you could face, the most fearful thing that could present itself, it is not greater than that love that God has for you. The love that God has for you is greater than all that you are, could think or could ever have in this life. And that is the love God wants you to live in and experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. You truly are love. You are love. You just not only showed love, but you gave love because you are love and you love us. Let that love wash over us. And Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the authority of your name, that your love would capture, your love would saturate, your love would form in us that life of Christ, that your love would wash over us, cleanse us, that love would drive out fear, that love will drive out pain, that love will overcome any obstacle because only that love that you have, which is eternal from your own heart, is able to do that. Thank you for your mighty love. May we grow and be refreshed and empowered. May we go out and live in that love and show others what that love looks like in our love for you. Bless you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you very much for listening. Glory to God. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the Donate button.